Well, as we reach the end of Joshua, the final chapter leaves us with a very strong challenge. Joshua makes mention about halfway, midway through the, the chapter, uh, a very strong challenge to Israel in saying, choose this day who you will serve. And at this point, the warning is offered to Israel, choose your next words. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, rose and fought against 
So I had transferred out to uh, Grace, and my wife, who was planning on transferring from the community college where she was at, where we were both going at the time to continue her American Sign Language down in Cincinnati, um, decided, no, I, I think that there's something here between us, and so I'm going to follow you. And she went to Bethel College, and then she walked in instead to be closer to me and receive actually a better uh, education there as Bethel was ranked like second in the nation in her sign language. And so she followed me along, and we went up to, to northern Indiana and made our home up there. We got plugged into the church, we continued and graduated from our college, and I remember we would spend our weekends together. I would usually go up and, and see her on uh, Fridays, and then on Sundays she would come down and we would go to church together. Well, on one Sunday, I remember having this whole thing out as far as our engagement and how it was going to go down. And I picked out the perfect spot on all that is this gazebo that was down right on the island, or right down next to one of the lake in the village where there was a bunch of these little pointy little shops and everything else. 
called are the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And these are the first twins that are mentioned here in Scripture. And even before they were born, there was a struggle between them in the womb of Rebekah. Now this is one of the coolest things ever when my wife was pregnant, being able to see the imprint of a hand as it pushed from our sons. Within a it was just the, the most strangest thing ever. I'm sure some people are really grossed out by it, but I just found it so cool. My wife not so much because most of the time it was like foots to the bladder and everything else. But, but there was a struggle. So you can imagine how comfortable as a woman it would be to have a child in the womb stretching out every which way and, and popping hip, hips out of the socket or whatever else. But to have two of them wrestling inside of you would be a different story altogether. And that's what Rebecca had to go through. And their prenatal fighting foreshadowed their later conflict in Genesis 25. And yet both Jacob and Esau, even though Esau was born first, Both Jacob and Esau were then fathers of great nations. We see that God later changed Jacob's name to Israel in Genesis 32, 28. And he became the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, of whom stand here now listening to this retelling of their history. And Esau's descendants were the Edomites, told in Genesis 36. And Edom was a nation that plagued Israel in their later years. And was finally judged by God as recounted in the prophet Obadiah. And so you see this conflict continue to happen. But God chose the younger, Jacob, here to carry on the Abrahamic covenant while Esau was excluded from the Messianic line. When you continue, we then arrive at Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the elder brother of Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. Aaron was three years old, in fact, when Moses was born. And in a day when elder brothers were respected and held a place of honor in the family, God flipped that expectation upside down yet again. As he did with Jacob and Esau, now he was done with Moses and Aaron. God chose the younger brother to be exalted to a place of leadership, and he chose the elder brother to be the assistant. Which brings us to the Exodus from Egypt to the Red Sea in verses 6 through 7. Israel was in slavery for 400 years, followed by 10 plagues to release Israel from the clutches of the wicked Pharaoh. And then the Great Red Sea was parted, and Israel walked across it on dry land while God held the army of Pharaoh from advancing, causing darkness to overshadow them and, and keep them back while Israel walked across on dry land. And only after passing over did God move, allowing the Egyptians to pursue them right into a watery grave. So then Israel continues and they arrive at Mount Sinai and they're given the law, the Ten Commandments, and we see this time now in the wilderness and in the land of the Amorites, son of the grave. So upon their escape, receiving the Ten Commandments, God's expectations of holiness for his chosen people, their arrival the promised land was not without issue. As after sending in twelve spies, ten of them return fearful of the inhabitants, and they say, we can't take what God has said we should have. And the lack of belief in God's word and promises brought forth the wrath of God on Israel and their failure to now they are barred off from it, they are shunned, they are sent back into the wilderness to wander and curse them the 40 years of wandering in this wilderness until the unbelieving generation that refused to act on the faithful promises of God had passed away. And God instead brought them into the land of the Amorites during this time. The land of the Amorites included Syria and parts of Israel. And we see that in this time, there are two kings of the Amorites named Sion and Og, who were defeated by the Israelites under Moses' leadership in Deuteronomy 31. And later, then, during the conquest of the promised 
and Joshua ended up slaying five more, as we've already seen in the account of Joshua that we've been through. But then in verse 9 and 10, he mentions a couple other people, Balak and Balaam. Very interesting story. If you get to read it, it starts in Numbers 22. But you see, after Moses defeated the kings of Sinai and Mog, King Balak called upon the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites. Now understand, Balaam was not a false prophet. He was an actual prophet. And it shows because as he brings, as Balak, this king, brings Balaam to offer a curse on Israel for the, the plague that they have been to him and his nation, Balaam first offers 14 sacrifices on seven altars and he meets with the Lord in Numbers 23. And then he declares the message that God gave to him. A blessing on Israel, not a curse. So Balak brings Balaam in and says, I want you to curse Israel. Balaam says, okay, but it can't. All I can do is bless them because it is what God has told me and given me to say. And not just one time, but three. And 23a, he says, how can I curse those, this is Numbers 23a, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? And again, in verse 20, I have received a command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot change it. And then in chapter 24, verse 5, we see a third blessing in which Balaam says, How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Now Balaam's three prophecies of blessing on Israel infuriated the king of Moab, who told the prophets to go back home without any reward. But before he left, Balaam reminded the king that he had said from the very beginning that he could only say what God told so if God didn't even curse on his people, he couldn't share a curse. He could only reiterate the blessing of the Lord. And then he gave the king more prophecies on top of that. And by the time he gets to the fourth prophecy that he gives to this king, as if it wasn't already enough, going against what the king had said, he just pours it on even more. The fourth and final prophecy foretells the Messiah, the Savior that would come from Israel. In chapter 24, 17 of Numbers, the law says, A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheph. Does this sound familiar to you? Because to me, it's, it's kind of given off a little bit of Genesis 3.15. The Protobian Jalion. The first gospel 
Joshua commands here in verses 14 and 15 a fear of the Lord. This Proverbs 9 and 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Not just fear the Lord, but to serve Him in sincerity and faithfulness. Deuteronomy 10 and 12 says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And he demands that they put away other gods, and if not, to choose which ones they will serve that day. This is where it gets in. Joshua is saying to the people of Israel, choose your next words very carefully. Because your next decision will determine the trajectory from here on. Deuteronomy 6.13 says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Choose who it is that you're going to serve, but just understand, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Israel responds in verses 16 through 18. It says, Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight, who preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the peoples from whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. It's a good response. It's the right response. And it's a smart response. He is a holy, 
snowy Santa in the sky who drools over easy decisions during invitational hymns. Joshua seeks to put down that blathering self-confidence that makes emotional commitments rather than shutting its mouth and counting the cost. If your stomach doesn't hurt after that blowout, I don't know what else is going to A commitment to God is a costly one. You think, but grace is free. It absolutely is. But your life also doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to God, and so at the same time, it costs everything. But Israel insists in verse 21, they say, no, we will serve him. So Joshua offers a bit of a test here in 22 to show that a commitment needs to be sincere. And Joshua says, Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. Joshua was saying, Not if, but when. When you do forsake your God. Because he said, It's only a matter of time until you do. This conversation is going to be the proof. It's going to be the witness against you. And Israel affirms, following that, in the end of 22, he says, And they say, we are witnesses. Israel says, so be it. We'll condemn ourselves if we have to, but this is the severity by which the sincerity they are approaching is commitment to the Lord. There's a tension that we must face here between living and serving the Lord and understanding that was shared prior to this. We cannot serve the Lord, but we must serve the Lord. We have to serve Him because He's the only one worth serving, and yet at the same time, Joshua makes very clear, we can't. Not at least on our own. But by the grace of God, we can. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please Him. And so no amount of church attendance no amount of Bible studies or devotional reading, no amount of service that you do within the church, none of that is pleasing to God without faith. It's actually disgusting to Him because it's not done for Him. You have to serve Him because He's the only one worthy of your service.
And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the cherub. And that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. And so Joshua sent the people away, every man to his parents. Clear expectations are made. Statutes and rules were set up for them to follow. Now a covenant is an agreement that is made between two parties. In fact, the Hebrew word for covenant was the word karat, which means to cut. And so when a covenant is made, it's literally, you are literally cutting a covenant between two parties. And so when a covenant was cut, an offering was made, normally an animal. And what would happen is this animal would be cut in half and put on two separate sides. And the parties that were making the covenant would walk between the animal as a symbol and a picture of saying, if I don't hold up my end of the bargain, then may be done to me what's been done to these animals. Covenants were life commitments. Or in the case of breaking one, a death commitment. Where any statute or expectation of a covenant was broken, death would be the result. So these things, these covenants were not taken lightly. Imagine if you if you broke a promise, it cost you your life. Or you'd have to be cut in half. There may be some of us in this room that at this point in our lives might look like ground beef. There may not be much left of us. How many times have you been divided in half at this point? But this wasn't a covenant between two equals, as was normally seen in well, this was a covenant that was made with a deity, with God. Which, if you study the history of, of these ancient religions, was absolutely unheard of. Because for a God to make a covenant with a people would mean that that God was also making a promise to say, if I fail, may it be done to me what's been done to me. And you're not going to find that in other religions because other religions have gods that can fail. And the last thing they want is their god to fail because it means that their god is not. And so these covenants were not made in other religions and other, other cultures with deities. These covenants were made between kings and subjects and between equal parties, but never between a, de a deity until we get to Israel here. And we see a God, the God, putting his own life as his work. 
They do a much better job at preserving those stories. But secondly, it's seen very clearly here by Joshua, who records all that was said in the book of the law. It shows us here that Israel was not just simply an oral tradition culture, but were people of the book. They had a written language. They recorded their history meticulously. In its covenants and in their statutes that are required by their God. So Joshua keeps the written record here, and then he finally gives, in verse 26, a physical witness to that record. A stone set up as a marker of this event that would be a witness in the case of Israel backing out of the covenant renewal of that chapter. In the pagan religions of the day, it was the various gods who were summoned as witnesses. But in this world that belongs to Yahweh, it's the very things of creation, namely the stones that speak to his covenant. God doesn't need a witness of another deity, lesser or anything else. He has creation. It all belongs to him. And in this case, even the rocks would cry out that the Lord was worthy of faithfulness from his creation. Even stones would speak as a witness against his people if they were to fail. And as Joshua concludes, real quickly, because I'm running out of time, it's really going to be turned into like two full sermons. But 29 through 33, the rest of the chapter, we see that Joshua dies at the rival age of 110. And he's buried in his own inheritance in Ephraim. And then it's recorded also that Israel would continue into their faithfulness beyond Joshua and the elders that, that followed him. Although in the next book of Judges would show that that commitment would be short-lived. But at least for a while, they would remain steadfast in all of these assertions that they made that they would be committed to the Lord. We see that Joseph and his bones were buried at Shechem, where the altar of the Lord was set up, and that Eleazar the priest dies and is buried in Gibeah in Ephraim. And all of this comes to a, a nice little close here, and then as you get into Judges, it kind of picks up a little before, and so you get the retelling of, of Joshua's death again and, and before going into the rest of it. But if this 